This is a tragic case that I don't think many people are aware of, but it deserves to be remembered. Because of the terrible traumatic death, the appalling torture she went through, and the horrible few days on earth. The victim wasn't just a beautiful innocent person. She was very compassionate, and everyone loved her. There are some grave senses to this case, and we're about to look at it, in detail. Lisa Renee, aged 16 in 1994, came to the States to fulfill her dream of becoming a surgeon. Gifted and brilliant, it seemed like a great career prospect for Lisa. In her first semester at her new high school, she just wanted to succeed, and make the most of her opportunities. She and her sister, Pearl Renee, came to the US a few years earlier, along with her two older brothers, Stanfield Vitalis, 28, and Nick Renee, 19. But leaving the Virgin Islands was a tremendous transition for Lisa. Still, the girl has maintained straight A grades, and she's one of her top students. She hoped to return to her home, with the knowledge and ability to help her own people. And to do so, she had to study extra hard every night. And on that particular night, she had to study for quite a long time, since she had an exam the following day. So, on the night of the 24th of September 1994, Around 8 p.m., Lisa was at her sister's apartment in Arlington, when she heard bangs and aggressive knocks at her front door. Just as she was about to open the door, she heard male voices outside shouting, let us come in. They claimed to be FBI agents, so she was so freaked out. But she called her sister instead, and Pearl told her to call 911, and she would leave work and come home right away. At this point, she calls a dispatcher from the Arlington Police Department. And when Lisa was talking to the dispatcher, the assailants are breaking through the sliding glass door of one room. Then four guys in camouflage gear, with ski masks, come rushing to grab Lisa. The dispatcher keeps trying to contact Lisa as she screams, but one of the men asks Lisa who is talking to her, and the call ends. After several unsuccessful calls, the dispatcher gets nearby patrol units to head to the location. While the police were coming down the road with their sirens blazing, they passed right by the abductors, who had Lisa in the back seat, at gunpoint. They were on the scene even before Lisa's sister, securing the scene, and trying to subdue Pearl. However, there is an evident and dangerous situation, and there is a deadline by the time she gets there. Detectives recognized that right away, and started assessing the situation. The kidnapping sounded pretty bad like there was foul play, and violence involved. So signs of a struggle were visible, everything has been knocked over. Lisa was studying on the floor, and books were out, and homework was scattered, some stuff was torn. But it looks like Lisa, is in big trouble. On top of that, the bedroom's sliding door was broken, and pieces of glass littering the bedroom adjacent to the living room, where Lisa studied. The forensic science technicians realized an abduction was going on, and expedited their crime scene investigation as fast as possible, got all the evidence together, and shipped it off. But, there were no fingerprints or physical evidence of the abductors at the scene. And no sign of Lisa anywhere. The idea itself, of physically taking a 16-year-old from her home, is just out of this world. But it is obvious how crucial the first few hours are in a kidnapping investigation, so it was super quick for them to begin to connect the dots. Luckily Pearl was pretty cooperative, and during the interview, she mentioned that Lisa and her, lived with her brothers for a while. And the two of them had been arrested, for drug dealing recently and had been evicted. Pearl and Lisa weren't with them anymore, and they went out to a music festival in Houston. They weren't even in town. Still, detectives asked Pearl to call them, to see what they had to say. In the beginning, Stanfield said he didn't know who wanted his sister killed, and it had nothing to do with him or his brother's impending drug charges. Still, he was willing to meet with authorities for more questions when they arrived, and he seemed entirely cooperative. Before they left the scene, the forensics team took care, 
fiber, and glass, from the broken sliding door as evidence. Basically, there's some physical evidence of the abductors, but no fingerprints. And at this point, detectives contacted the local FBI branch in Texas. Firstly, the abductors say they're FBI agents in the 911 call. Secondly, they're in an embarrassing situation, and want to move fast. On top of it, neighbors reported seeing four black men in camouflage fatigues, around the apartment complex just before the 911 call. They also spotted a champagne-colored Cadillac, driving around and parked next to the four teenagers, lurking around Lisa's apartment. Those two details immediately gave Fort Worth's FBI division full jurisdiction over the case. Luckily, an FBI agent who lives close by, can be routed right to the scene in minutes. The following morning, around 3 a.m., the brothers Stanfield and Neil called detectives again with more information about the case. While they had returned home, they somehow found the champagne Cadillac, described by the Arlington residents. Unfortunately, they were in Irving, Texas, 30 minutes away. Then they told detectives the address and hung up. They come to investigate this tip, and they agree to go head over to Irving. When they knock, a woman is a home, and the hood of the Cadillac out front. She told investigators she didn't know anything about kidnapping, and the Cadillac was hers. It was nighttime, and her husband was working, and wasn't at home. However, authorities still hoped Lisa Renee was alive, so they proceeded with caution. The woman agreed to let them search her house. After discreetly looking around, they found nothing. All the places where Lisa could have been held captive were searched, every closet, and every crawl space they could find without a warrant. An Irving officer even went to do a cursory search in the attic, turned on the flashlight, and looked around. It was empty, so he went back downstairs. Lisa and her captives weren't in the house, so there was no evidence of an abduction, or indication that they had been there. Now they're focusing on the brothers, and there was this weird tip. They didn't find anything, and now they have this pending drug charge. It's the early hours of the first morning after she was reported missing, so that's the best lead at the moment. By this point, having been assured that the FBI would not be interested in their current charges, the two brothers started talking. In reality, they had been involved with more drug dealers since their other crimes. Both had taken part in a messed up drug deal. They took $5,000 from Steve, he was supposed to help them get 9 pounds of marijuana. Neil and Stanfield are like mediators. They go and get the drugs, and come back to get their cut. But the brothers never returned with the drugs, and they kept the cash to pay their lawyers, who were working on their previous drug charges. It turned out that the drug dealer Steve they were looking for, was actually Stephen Christopher Beckley, who lived in Irving. As time was running out, the Arlington Police Department and the FBI, made a plea to the public. It was a bit of a dead end, so they did a press conference. Then on day two, detectives got a surprise visit from the Irving home, they had searched the night of Lisa's kidnapping. He was the husband of the woman, who had seen the public outcry. He knew what was going on, and he had a couple of things to say about it. He suspected his wife's two brothers, Orlando Hall, 24, and Demetrius Hall, 19, of abducting Lisa Renee. He thinks they're somehow involved with the abduction. Because his wife threw a barbecue at his house, the day before Lisa's abduction. Both of the brothers were there with Stephen Beckley, and they wore camouflage clothing, which seemed weird to him. He knew they were involved in drug trafficking, because both brothers had served time for drug charges in Arkansas. Both of them had rap sheets from other states. In fact, he caught them doing drugs at his house, and made it very clear that it wasn't acceptable. But something else made him suspicious. His neighbors told him they had seen four young men, drive up to his house with a champagne-colored Cadillac, and they got out wearing camo. During the press conference, it was announced that the men they were looking for were all wearing fatigues. So, he voluntarily came forward to talk about the case within 24 hours. He told investigators that Orlando Hall slept at the house, that night and returned there. 
The younger Hall, Demetrius, was on parole for dealing cocaine, and his older brother, Orlando, was in the same boat. So, law enforcement knows a lot about the Hall brothers. They're like the usual suspects who carry charges like drug trafficking, and aggravated assault. In just a few hours, they got a warrant to search the Irving home, that was previously searched. There was a lot of forensic data at the scene that could help the investigators. And this time, they found a small souvenir baseball bat, hidden between the shelves in the child's room. They found a green shirt with insulation fibers in the closet. Investigators noticed the stereotypical pink fibers in the insulation. They picked up insulation samples in the attic, and took them to the FBI laboratories. After testing, it was discovered that the fibers did match, which meant that the shirt had been in the attic for a while. There were also camo pants in the attic, as if someone had changed clothes and left them there. The glass fragments from Lisa's apartment were compared to those in the small baseball bats. The shards were examined, and refractive indexing. The souvenir baseball bat was embedded in Lisa's sliding door with the same glass. When the lab results come back, the warrants for Demetrius Hall, Orlando Hall, and Stephen Beckley go out. At this point, they're the three main suspects. Demetrius was found at his father's house in El Dorado, Arkansas. They caught him peacefully, but he didn't want to talk to investigators. They found Stephen Beckley at a friend's house in El Dorado. In the beginning, Beckley was not cooperating, he didn't want to talk, but investigators started to get on his defensive emotions. And speak to him after hours of interrogation. And it turns out that he was so scared of a fourth man, the police did not know about it yet. Bruce Webster, the fourth man, was a 22-year-old hitman. And he is the main reason Beckley would not talk because he was sure Webster would find him, and kill him and his family. In the end, Beckley slowly opened up, and his story is brutal, and the consequences are awful. Beckley used to get tons of marijuana, and deliver it to Arkansas. And he stored it in Marvin Holloway's house. Marvin Holloway is the one providing the money and power. Beckley introduced Orlando Hall to Neil and Stanfield as local dealers who could get large amounts of pot. He gave the brothers $5,000 for 9 pounds of marijuana. But the brothers never showed their faces again. So he tracked them down after they didn't show up with the drugs. So he called him up, and the brothers claimed they were robbed. They're like, we were carjacked, they took all the money, they took the drugs and my car. So, Beckley tracked the brothers to the Arlington apartment they shared with their sisters. When they pulled up, they saw that the brothers were still driving the car they said was stolen. So Beckley called Marvin Holloway, and told him about being double-crossed. They call in the hitman Bruce Webster. Someone with a long track record of assaults, rape, terrible crimes. The following night, Webster flew down to Dallas. Orlando drove the gold Cadillac to Arlington, Texas, with Demetrius, Webster, and Beckley. The boys were prepared with guns, the souvenir baseball bat from the kids' room, duct tape, and gasoline. They planned to pour gasoline over the two brothers, and force them to return the money. If they didn't agree to that, then they were going to set them on fire. Webster came up with this, and he laid out the plan really well. While Beckley and Orlando scouted out the apartment building, Webster went to the front door with Dimitris. They started beating on the front door, and pretending they were FBI agents. They figured the brothers would take them seriously. But they hear a woman from inside, and they aren't answering the door. Orlando, Beckley, and Webster were on the side, where Lisa was on the phone with her sister. At that point, it's like a catalyst. They're determined to get revenge and not leave empty-handed. So, all the guys ran in when Demetrius broke through the glass door. They dragged Lisa out of the apartment and forced her into the car. As they passed the arriving officers on the main road, Lisa was again held in the floorboard at gunpoint. Then they got into Beckley's Ford Escort, and drove to the Irving house. When authorities got to Orlando Hall's sister's house, he hid in the attic. Meanwhile, Webster, Beckley and Demetrius are leaving with Lisa. When the FBI investigators showed up, 
Orlando hid in the attic's insulation. Irving's officer went up, turned on the light, looked behind boxes, walked around and looked. But it sounds like Orlando pulled some insulation off the roof itself. Because his shirt had insulation on it. When Webster, Beckley and Demetrius were driving to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. On the way, they raped Lisa in the back seat. In Pine Bluff, they got her tied to a chair, and again took turns raping her. For the past two days, she was locked in the bathroom. Orlando flew back the next day to join the group, and they kept Lisa in the toilet, and covered her with a hood and a bag. Beckley told the cops that were the last time he saw Lisa alive. She's probably still in that motel with Webster and the others. Hoping she's still alive, cops move into the motel in Arkansas. The FBI takes action as fast as possible when they get this tip. When they get there, they start talking to the manager. Beckley shows up too, they bring him along. They're working as fast as they can, they're trying to do field interrogations, they're trying to do everything they can while talking to witnesses. The motel manager remembered seeing men just two days earlier show up to have a girl with them. She heard one of the men tell the others, to get the girl back into the car when she fled. At that point, the men drove around the back of the motel. The manager did not report that information, did not call 911, and did not say anything. After some time, they got into the room, and then repeatedly raped Lisa in the bathroom. And when the other rooms reported noise from their room, a security guard came to check. They decided to move motels. It was supposed to happen the following day, and now, the FBI are just one step behind. They're looking for evidence at the scene to help Lisa get out of this nightmare. And fortunately, they find partial finger, and palm prints behind the bathroom toilet, where she was kept. And in fact, we can corroborate that Beckley is telling the truth. But, he then said very upsetting details. After what happened at the motel, Orlando Hall joined the three men in Pine Bluff. He decided that Lisa knew too much, and they were done with her. So he called the money man. Marvin Holloway came down to Orlando to deal with Lisa, and he too decided she knew too much and needed to be taken care of. So, Webster and Orlando dug a grave in Bird Lake Park. While Demetrius was left behind to clean the room and any evidence. Then, Beckley, Webster and Orlando Hall went back that night to kill, and bury, Lisa Renee, in the remote park. After a while, even with flashlights, they couldn't find the grave, and eventually, they gave up. They returned to the hotel, and hoped for better luck in the morning. So they decided to move to a new place, and try again in the morning. So they moved on to the second motel, and tried again in the morning. The following day Orlando, Webster, and Beckley, took Lisa back there. They put her hood over her head, and walked her to the graveyard. Orlando hit Lisa, in the head with a shovel, then she screamed, and tried to run. Beckley chased her down, tackled her, and then Orlando hit her with a shovel again, before handing it back to Webster. Then they took turns beating her, in the head with the shovel. Lisa was actually gagged and dragged back to the grave site, where she was stripped. Beckley couldn't handle the killing, so he stayed behind as a lookout. After Webster had finished carrying Lisa Renee, he returned to Orlando. And this was the point where all hope of finding Lisa Renee, alive went out. Despite the sleepless nights, and expedited forensic research, it wasn't fast enough. Bruce Webster was seen pulling into the parking lot of the second motel by investigators, who are there right now. When he got to the motel room, he had a woman in the car. The investigators do stuff like fingerprinting, and take fingerprints off the motel, so they arrested Bruce Webster and that woman. But, she was just a date he had that day. They questioned her for an hour, and she had no idea what was going on. She just met Webster that day, and that's what happened to her. So she let go of her, and put their focus on the tons of proof against Webster. But Webster says he didn't know anything about what was going on. When the media got wind of it, multiple suspects were apprehended in Lisa Renee's case, including Orlando Hall. Basically, Orlando figured they were gonna catch me at some point, so he turned himself in. 
Once all four men were in custody, detectives started pitting each of the other suspects against each other. They basically went through Stephen Beckley's confession with each witness, and if they veered off track, they'd keep questioning. And so they finally got Bruce Webster to talk. He was the last person to admit to anything about what happened. He admitted he outlined Lisa Renee's death Doug Lisa's grave in Pine Bluff Park. Revealed that he, and Orlando Hall had buried Lisa alive, burned her clothes, and buried everything relevant to her death. Investigators then took Bruce Webster back to Bird Lake Park, to find Lisa Renee's grave late at night. They found the disturbed area where her grave had been, and they began processing the scene. When they found the grave, they noticed fresh cuts on the bark of the nearby tree caused by the wild shovel's wings. Apparently, one of the people digging cut her elbow. They saw blood, and all of them cried and paused for a while, and they couldn't finish examining her body. They took her body to the FBI state laboratories, and ligature marks on her arms and hands from being tied up for a long time. She got lacerations on her face, neck, and back of her head from the shovel. It was determined that she had probably been buried alive. They hit her with a shovel quite a bit, gagged her, and buried her. Then she probably woke up and tried to narrow her path out. The medical examiner said she died of suffocation, and blood loss from the skull. Lisa Renee was taken from Texas to Arkansas over state lines, so the kidnapping became a federal case. As part of a superseding indictment on November 1994, Orlando, Demetrius, Webster, Beckley, and Holloway were charged with kidnapping resulting in death, conspiracy to commit kidnapping, the possession of cannabis for sale, and using and carrying a firearm during a violent crime. Eventually, the government announced in February 1995 that Orlando and Webster would face death sentences. Orlando Hall was convicted in October 1995 and was sentenced to death for kidnapping that resulted in his death by a federal jury. He got a life sentence plus five years on the other charges. He became the first person to die under the Federal Death Penalty Act. Bruce Webster was convicted of murder, kidnapping with death, conspiracy, and use of a firearm during a crime of violence in June 1996. On the recommendation of a federal jury, Webster was sentenced to death for kidnapping resulting in death. On the other charges, he got five years plus a life sentence. Demetrius, Beckley, and Holloway all pleaded guilty in exchange for lesser sentences and testified against Orlando and Webster. Demetrius Hall pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit kidnapping and got 25 years in a plea deal. Demetrius' mom asked the judge for leniency because her other son, Orlando, was already on death row. Demetrius got out of prison in August 2016. Stephen Beckley pleaded guilty to a kidnapping that caused death. Even though the charge generally carries a mandatory life sentence, he was eligible for a lesser sentence due to his substantial assistance. Beckley got a 30-year sentence. As for Beckley, in fact, he deserved death and may have received a death sentence if he wasn't cooperative. In November 2019, Beckley registered as a sex offender. He'll be on the sex offender registry until November 12, 2041. He got out of prison in April 2020. Marvin Holloway was present in his pleadings and financed the crimes but did not directly participate in Renee's abduction. Admitted to being an accessory after the fact of kidnapping and interstate transportation. He got a 15-year sentence and was released in May 2008. In 2019, Bruce Webster's death sentence was overturned because he was intellectually disabled. In November 2020, Orlando Hall was executed by lethal injection at 49. Orlando, who converted to Islam as he was on death row, thanked his supporters in his final statement. Orlando Hall's trial brought Vitalis in to testify. He said if he had called the cops right away, she might still be alive. Vitalis said, I just want to say that justice was served. But it won't make my sister come back. In 1995, Neil and Vitalis were both charged with drug possession. They pleaded guilty and were sentenced to five years of probation in prison. Neil violated his probation while out on supervised release, and he had to go back to jail in fall 2000. 
In 2001, he got out again. In 2013, Neil pleaded guilty to conspiracy to launder money and was sentenced to 151 months in prison. He is serving his sentence in Dallas and is scheduled for release in 2024.